Please take your Bibles and turn with you, if you will, back to that passage we read in the book of Exodus just a few moments ago. Today we're looking at Bitter Waters and Sweet, Naomi and the Desert, part 5. Exodus chapter 15, verses 22 through 27. Now, the first thing that we noticed as we were going through this passage contains one of God's most important principles in his plan for divine training and the discipline of his people. No pain, no gain. God clearly uses adversity to conform his people to the image of Christ. In parallel, we also saw three corollary principles. Pain first for focus. God brings the pain to get our attention. Pain second for cleansing. God uses it to burn the dross out of our lives. And pain first, the third principle, pain first for spiritual growth. Those of you who are gardeners know that you have to trim your various plants at certain times of the year, which will produce the maximum amount of growth, the most beautiful flowers. And God does that with us by letting affliction come into our lives. The second thing we saw was the worse comes before the better. And then we saw in many passages on this that suffering comes before glory. So if we feel like we're going through unbearable suffering now, we know, because the Bible says so, that God has designed it for our good and for his glory. Because God uses those times to burn the trash out of our lives and to conform us to the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the big principle is, which ties into our text, we must learn to quit complaining about how much we hurt and how much we are suffering because of our present experience and emotions, because God is using it to conform us to the image of Christ. Remember what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. What a difference between the temporal things that rot and fall apart and get blown over by hurricanes and knocked over by earthquakes and swept away by fires and war. Those are temporal things. If that kind of stuff can happen to it, it's temporal. So we don't look to the temporal, we look to the eternal. And that helps us get over those times that are so difficult in our lives. Suffering before glory is, in fact, one of God's key training principles all over the Bible. It clearly is indicated in our text, which is Exodus 15, 22 and following. Exodus, as I think I mentioned before, is actually the exposition for an entire book, an exposition of the principle of suffering before glory, and it starts here in chapter 15. Remember what James said? Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Do you believe the promises of God? Jesus made that promise. We also saw the principle in multiple passages in both the Old and New Testament. This exact same principle of suffering before glory. We saw it in Exodus, Numbers, Joshua, Psalms, Matthew, Luke, John, Romans, 2 Corinthians, Philippians, 2 Timothy, James, Hebrews, 1 Peter, and Revelation. And that's only scratching the surface. But I read you verses out of every one of them that state that principle specifically. Perhaps Peter best summarizes the suffering of Christians in 1 Peter chapter 1 and chapter 4. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Now because Jesus went through it, he in his grace allows us to go through it. Here's what it says in chapter 4. Building on chapter 1 with the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, we find in chapter 4, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. 
but rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. That's what he talked about in chapter 1, verse 11. You are partakers of Christ's sufferings. That when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be also glad with exceeding joy. Sufferings followed by glory. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he's evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you, that includes all of us here, let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf, for the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to, say it with me, the will of God. Let's read that again. I'm going to read it and ask you to say those words with me. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God. People, there's nothing outside of God's will. He's in control. He's not partly in control. He doesn't control half the territory. He controls it all. Satan can't make a move without God's permissive will. According to the will of God, commit their keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. The second thing which we began to develop last week was we noticed that the people murmured. And we pointed out that this is the very first time their murmuring is recorded after they left Egypt. Now they murmured once before they left Egypt, but they'd only been three days in, on the road when that occurred. And most of us, unfortunately, can't bear any kinds of inconvenience, we're Americans, uh, and we start to complain. The Bible says that Israel put God to the test ten times by complaining, Numbers 14, 22, because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times and have not hearkened to my voice. God said they're going to die in the wilderness. And notice the two things that they got. They saw his glory. They saw his miracles. You and I have seen greater glory than this. We've seen the Lord Jesus Christ. We've seen what he did. We have the complete revelation of God. They didn't have a Bible like you and I have to be able to read everything that God did from the moment of creation through the end of the book of Revelation. You and I are far more accountable than those people who murmured against God ten times. We have the answer to every human problem in life in our hands. And we have the privilege of owning it. There have been centuries where people begged to have Bibles, countries where they've been killed for having Bibles. There are places in the world today where people are killed for having Bibles. And you've got dozens of them in the pews here. You've got probably several at home. Why did he kill them? They saw his glory and his miracles, and then they put him to the test. The ten times of rebellion brought Israel to the point of no return. And we need to remember always that although God is long-suffering, there does come a point of no return. They had seen the power of God in the ten plagues, yet they tempted God ten times. One for each plague. 
The plagues should have caused them to have faith. Say, hey, this is nothing compared to what we just saw happen in Egypt. I mean, water for God, that's not a problem. He made the heavens and the earth. It should have given them faith. And it should have given them the fear of the Lord. Because as they saw the judgments of God, the heavy hand of God upon the Egyptians, they should realize this is not a God to be monkeyed with. Should have caused them to fear the Lord and not to complain or rebel. Now we began looking at the first three times. There are ten times they rebelled, as you know. Uh, against The first one was against God's qualified and appointed leader. That was in Exodus 14, when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes. Behold, the Egyptians marched after them. They were so afraid. They cried out to the Lord and said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt. Typical way of saying things in Hebrew. Hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Seems to me that they all wanted to go. That they're kind of forgetting what they'd been going through in Egypt. What you doing to us? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt? Okay, if you told me in Egypt, so why are you here and not back in Egypt? Saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. I don't find a whole lot of that in the text where they got gigantic groups of people together saying, you know, oh, we really love the Egyptians. We really like serving them. It's better than being the boss. Man, being down here, you know, slaving away, building pyramids and sphinxes and digging in the dirt and getting beaten by our Egyptian taskmasters and not having straw given to us. You know, we tend to forget what we have done because we want to point the finger at somebody else. For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Listen, Fred, you're going to die in the wilderness in any case. This world is a wilderness. You are going to die. Timing is a question. But unless the Lord Jesus Christ comes back before you die, you will die. We just don't like to think about it. My life and your life is getting shorter as I speak. Those of you who are here on time at 11 o'clock this morning, your life is now 52 minutes shorter than it was at 11 o'clock. That's a fact. You're not going to add anything on the end of it. The day of your death is appointed. This is not something to complain to God about. Instead, it should be a motivation to serve Christ 100% because we don't know how much time we have left. Give your entire all to Christ. Don't hold anything back because someday you will stand before him and you will give an account. Well, that's a very important lesson to learn from that first time of complaining. And last week I also added to what I had previously said about rebellion against God's ordained leadership, and I expanded on that principle. We asked the question, why is rebellion against God's ordained leadership considered by God to be rebellion against God? And we saw there were at least four reasons. Number one, God always provides leadership in every sphere of authority which he has ordained. Leadership is necessary for those under authority for their protection, for the direction for their discipline and a host of other reasons. That's supported by many passages of scripture. There are four categories where God has ordained authority. And in those categories, God has provided intermediate leaders between him and those who are under their authority. God also doesn't just suggest, God commands that those leaders be obeyed. Those categories are the home, and we looked at those passages in Ephesians and Colossians, the church, and we looked at some very specific passages in Hebrews, the government, and we looked at passages over in Romans for that, and in the workplace. And as we went through those, we saw that at least in the home, there is a dual level of authority. There are husbands and there are wives who are in positions of authority, and the children are to obey on both levels. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. That's Ephesians 6.1. Colossians 3.20. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. 
But one of the two authorities is an intermediary authority between the husband and the children. The Bible says so. And that is the wife. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be unto their own husbands in everything. Now, I want to pause on that verse for just a second. As the church is subject unto Christ, as you look around today, the church is not very subject to Christ. Well, the true church is, but much that goes by the name of church is certainly not. But the true bride of Christ is subject to Christ. Though because we are sinners, even among real believers, we're not always subject to Christ. But Paul is setting forth the ideal standard here. Here is your standard. The Lord Jesus Christ is a perfect head. Your husband is not, I know that. But the Lord Jesus Christ is a perfect head. And as you follow him, in the same manner, with the same motives, with the same attitudes, with the same enthusiasm, you submit to the leadership of your husband because he has to represent Christ. His job is much more difficult than yours. Believe me, it's a lot easier just to obey and let somebody else take the blame than it is to be the one in charge who has to represent in every area of life Jesus Christ and what he would do, how he would act, how he would think, what are his motives, what are his attitudes. And the husband must do that for his wife and children. That's an incredible, awesome responsibility. Wives, don't complain about the submission. The other role is a lot more difficult. Because husbands will have to give an account to Christ how well did you represent me to your wife? How well did you represent me to your children? In the area of teaching them, as Jesus taught, go through the Gospels and find out how he taught. How did you represent me in the example that you set where you didn't say to kids, do as I say, not as I do? How well did you represent me in the issue of discipline? You can see some discipline if you want to look at Acts chapter 5. Ananias and Sapphira. The Lord Jesus Christ, the husband, must represent him. Must model him. Must be an example like Jesus. Then we saw the church. God has ordained authority in the church. Remember them that have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow. That puts me under the spotlight. I must live by faith. And you must follow that example. And you look down the road and you say, well, yeah, 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 but I see scary things down the road. If I follow his faith, look at the scary things that are down the road. And that's what he says at the end. Whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation, the end of their manner of life. You're looking at intermediate things when you're scared about walking by faith. What is the end of the manner of life? That's the word conversation. What is the end of the manner of life? The end is glory. Forget the intermediate stuff, the stuff you're scared of in between. Live by faith. Walk by faith. Walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh. The Spirit gives life. The flesh will kill you. And the flesh is parallel to the law in the book of Galatians. If you're trying to do it legalistically, you will never make it. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. Those are pretty powerful words. For they watch for your souls. I'm going to have to give an account someday. 
that I do a good job of watching for your souls. Not did I do a good job of raising money. Not did I do a good job of fixing the building, although I do a lot of that. Did I, did I do a good job of pacifying people when they were mad? No. The question is going to be, I have to give an account as those who watch for your souls. But there's a flip side to that, and that's where we ended last week, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. We're going to be taking the Lord's table in just a few minutes. We held a preparatory service <clears throat> on Friday evening so that we might focus on the cross, that we might focus on what Jesus did, what he suffered for us. And we looked at the passage where Jesus says, I thirst, where his real humanity demonstrates itself clearly, his perfect, sinless, but real humanity. I thirst. He suffered more than any of us have ever suffered. As we looked at that, none of us will be able to stand before him and complain that we had it harder than he ever had it. None of us. Someday I have to give an account for you and I want to do it with joy and not with grief. Not merely because, well, I wish I'd done a better job, but because if I have to give a bad account, and I can't hide anything, if I have to give it with grief, that will be unprofitable for you. Church pastors are parallel to a father ruling his household and the children where obedience is required. The pastoral office requirements are absolute. Then, if that is so, the requirement of obedience by the flock is also absolute, provided that the pastor does not require the violation of either a command or a prohibition in the Bible. There's a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. That doesn't mean sinless. It means without anything that can be held against him. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt, that means skilled at, teaching, not given to wine, not no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, he's not in it for the money, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. And then he goes back to that issue of marriage. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. And here's where he ties it to the church leadership. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God. What you see in microcosm is what you will see in macrocosm. The little tiny family unit is compared to and parallels with, in terms of authority and in terms of the way it works, with the church. In addition to the parallel authority of the father and the home, pastors clearly also have authority to stop troublemakers, critics, and false teachers. Titus chapter 1, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children not accused of riot or unruly. Very serious. We talked about that in detail in the past. Won't go into it again here. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. Now here it is. They're supposed to stop troublemakers. That he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers, those who speak against the truth. 
For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped. And he tells you why. They move in and out of the congregation. They spread their false doctrine. They spread innuendo. They spread gossip. They spread lies. They subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. We had an experience with that at Grace Bible Church in San Antonio 40-some years ago. We had a Catholic family come into the church. They claimed that they had been saved, a father, a mother, eight children. Everybody was happy to see them, nice to always have families with lots of children and so on. What we didn't realize was that they'd gotten involved in the charismatic movement, and they were going from house to house and holding prayer meetings, which seemed nice, you know, cottage prayer meetings going on. but. They claimed, and they were speaking in tongues and getting other people to do it, uh, they claimed at one point that a ball of fire appeared to them, which they said was the Shekinah glory, and that God had spoken to them and told them to take the church over. And so one Sunday morning, the entire group of them marched down to the front of the church as the service was in progress and said, God told us to take over the church. And they told my dad, get out of the pulpit. Well. If you know my dad, that wasn't a thing to say to him. He looked at him and he said, I'm sorry, we're a nonprofit corporation. And um, we have to go through the procedures for a nonprofit corporation, either for dissolution or for a merger or for turning it over to someone else. And so that requires a two week notice and it requires a vote of the entire congregation. Well, they didn't have 50% of the congregation, they had maybe 30%. And so uh, they fumed and stomped out. Two weeks later, the meeting was held and uh, the eldest son, who was in college at that time, sort of said, because they didn't have quite enough people, they had gone around during those two weeks trying to get more people on their side. They didn't have enough people. He said, I, th I think we should pray about this longer. And a little old lady in the church, she was about this tall, and on a cane, she got up and waved her cane at him and said, young man, sit down. We've prayed about it. <laughs> he sat down. Interestingly enough, today he's a judge. They voted, and the charismatic types were voted down. They stomped out in a huff. But to show you God's blessing, the following week, there were more people in church than had ever been there before. It was packed. A healthy body needs an elimination every now and then, and the church is the body of Christ. Rebuke them sharply, he says. Their mouths have to be stopped. One of those selves, even a prophet of their own, said the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Then we saw government, and we saw that it's ordained by God. Let every soul be subject to higher powers. There's no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. In other words, you resist the intermediate authority, and that means you're resisting God himself. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. We saw under work, servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in singleness of heart as unto Christ. Again, over in Colossians, servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye services, men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. Then we looked at the second reason why rebellion against God's ordained leadership is rebellion against God. The Bible commands that intermediate authority, that is divinely appointed leaders in home, church, government, and work, must be obeyed unless the leadership commands or prohibits you to do something that is required in the Bible. When you rebel against divinely qualified and appointed authority, you are directly disobeying a command of the Bible. Third reason why rebellion against God's ordained leadership is rebellion against God is this. Rebellion against authority is an attempt to establish your own personal authority and stems from pride, which is the sin of the devil. And we read you that passage out of Isaiah chapter 14. Now, those are all the theory, the theory of rebellion, if you will, the theory of authority, the theory of rebellion. Today, let's move out of rebellion theory and take the question to another level. 
where I would say the rubber meets the road. You know how that works. And people always want to know precisely the limit by which they are obligated <laughs> and beyond which they think that they're free from anything else. You know, what's the maximum I have to do? I mean, let me go, bring it down here, down to the rubber meets the road. I mean, I don't want to worry about that other stuff. Just what, how high do I have to jump? I mean, that's the way people are. They almost never want to do more than is required. We see that in the kid question. Do I really have to do it? In other words, don't I have other options? And the answer sometimes is no. There are no other options. Let me give you an illustration from the life of Christ. Luke chapter 10. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up. <laughs> Everybody's looking at me, right? A certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, so the lawyer is putting Jesus to the test. See if you can figure this one out, counselor. And tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus asks him some setup questions. And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? Now he's heard Jesus' sermons before this, so he knows the answer that Jesus will give. Because this is the answer that Jesus would give. But then he's going to, he thinks he's going to sneak up on Jesus and hit him with a question that Jesus can't answer. Or if he answers it, it'll be like really super pro-Jewish only. He answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. Because Jesus had said that before. They'd asked him, what are the, what's the great command in the law? And Jesus quotes that. And he says, the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So the lawyer already knows where Jesus stands on the issue. And so he quotes back the words to Jesus. But he, look at verse 29. He, willing to justify himself. The whole motive was not to know what's the right thing to do. The whole motive was to declare himself righteous. Because he was a good Jewish lawyer and he had lots of good Jewish clients. And he was specialist in Jewish law. That's the word that's used for lawyer here. He wanted to declare himself righteous. I'm good enough. I'm going to make it to heaven by pulling myself up on my own bootstraps. He, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, Aha, here comes the big surprise question. Not a surprise for Jesus. Because Jesus is God. He knew it was coming. And he already had a well-made illustration to slam the lawyer in the jowls and knock him down flat. Here's the question. Who is my neighbor? Well, if I have to love my neighbor as myself, I've got to know who my neighbor is. I mean, is that just the guy who lives on my right side and left side? Does it include the guy across the street? Uh, how does it mean everybody at the synagogue? Uh, how about everybody who comes to Jerusalem to the temple to worship? Which ones are my neighbors? And which Because some of those guys aren't really, really good Jews. I mean, some of them are bad. You know, they come once a year to sort of ease their conscience. Uh, who exactly is my neighbor? And of course, you know what Jesus follows with. He gives us the narrative of the Good Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves. And was stri they stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. We say, well, but those are the hierarchy. You know, those who are descended from Aaron, I mean, really, they shouldn't have to put up with that kind of stuff, you know. Uh, maybe he had an excuse. Priest. Likewise, a Levite. Well, you know, there's, there's the Aaronic priesthood, and he was from the tribe of Levi, but they were set apart special. But now we got the lower ones. We got the guys who are just Levites. 
They're the ones who had the special cities all around the country and they took in the tithes and they occasionally would come to do stuff in the temple. And the Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him. There was these guys that didn't miss him. He stared at him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Do you understand the issue? Compassion? Compassion? What is the Samaritan motivate, motivated by? He looks at a Jew and he has compassion. Jews hated Samaritans, and Samaritans hated Jews. Samaritans were a half-breed. They were people who, in their ancient history, had intermarried with Assyrians. They were considered impure. They had their own area of the land. They had their own temple. They had their own worship. They had their own sacrifices. It was sort of parallel to, but not quite exactly the same as, what was going on down in Jerusalem. He had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine and set him on his own beast. That means he walked and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more when I come again, I will repay thee. And so Jesus now asks a question to the lawyer. Which now of these three, thinkest thou, was neighbor unto him that fell among thieves? The Aaronic priest who lived in Jerusalem like this guy did. The Levites, who maybe one of them lived on each side of him. Were those his neighbors? The lawyer knows he's stuck. And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Now here's the rubber meets the road. Jesus applies it. Then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. The lawyer thought he had a great trick question that would clinch his case that he didn't have very many neighbors that he would have to be good to. Jesus killed that idea. Someone will always raise the question, okay, now here we are, back to, back to the principle of what is my specific obligation. So we're talking about leadership. We're talking about, okay, submission to leadership. Okay, but what if it's a, if it's a situation like the family, you know, uh, where you got multiple leaders? What if there are multiple leaders? And especially in the church, people who ask that question usually have a situation where they have one leader they don't like and would rather support a different leader. But what if there are multiple leaders? That's also a question that the Bible answers very clearly. What if there are multiple leaders and what if there's disagreement among the leaders? Who do you follow? Like for example, dad and mom are opposite ends of the spectrum and totally opposed to each other on some particular issue. Who do you follow? In short, God never ordains dual role leadership without giving one of the leaders the final authority. God always appoints one of the leaders as the principal leader if this question arises. Our time is up. We're going to have to start there, the Lord willing, next week. And I have many examples out of the Bible that um, I hope we'll be able to share next week. But now we have to pray and enter into the Lord's table. Let's join together in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the privilege of knowing Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. He is the final authority. He's the one who ordains intermediate authority. He's the one who puts all of us in some sphere under authority and at different times of our lives may change that authority. 
We certainly see that in government. We see that at work. We see that in the church. But Father, our job as those under authority is to learn to submit as unto Christ. How we praise you for that, for the privilege, the privilege of being under your ultimate authority. And we pray, Father, that you will take what we have studied and learned today and use it for the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.